inviting me on this very appropriate, gloomy, and dark day for my presentation about horror film. The weather couldn't be any more perfect. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. All right. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about horror film. Seems appropriate considering that Halloween is tomorrow. But I also wanted to talk about horror film in the context of social commentary. And as some of you already know, I am an English professor at GCC, but I also teach communications classes. And specifically, I teach classes in media and popular culture. One class, The Social Impact of Mass Media, is a class that has a focus on horror film. So that basically is what I'm going to be talking about today and talking about horror film and, and popular culture. And there are a good number of similarities between communications classes and English classes in that there is analysis that goes on and interpretation that goes on, looking for hidden meanings in text, whether it be written text or it happened to be film text or a combination of the two, and just some general social commentary as well. So I like to look at horror film, not just from an entertainment perspective, but the symbolic or the representational or the allegorical perspective. And again, as I had indicated that horror film has become so iconic in our popular culture, I wouldn't at all be surprised if you go to a Halloween party and you find a Dracula or you find a Frankenstein and that's because of Hollywood film. And when we think about popular culture, we usually talk about popular or mainstream, something that's become in some ways, as I was suggesting, immortalized when you think about those figures even though people haven't necessarily even watched those particular films or read the texts in which those films were based on. So I wanted to start with a little bit of an introduction, talking about culture, that basically culture is any group with shared behaviors. And that means that they have beliefs and attitudes and values that they share in commonality. That said, there's always individual difference so you don't want to stereotype and assume that everybody in that cultural group is exactly the same. But you can have some generalities that more often than not probably are accurate when you're looking at that particular group. And horror film re reviews the collective fears and anxieties, I suggest, and others have suggested as well, of each generation. And particularly for this presentation, I wanted to talk about fears in terms of the isms, which you might have heard of before, racism, classism, sexism. And I think that these fears are threats to the majority concept of what the majority calls, quote, normality. But of course, that's always very subjective. And what is normal also has an opposite, which is abnormal, and that leads to othering or difference. And that oftentimes is used to reinforce conflict. And that's what we see when we see things like racism and sexism and classism. Now, this idea of normality being subjective, I, I think was perhaps best stated in Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, if you're familiar with that text where there is a quote that says that normality is a majority concept. And I, I always think about that in the context of one of my favorite television shows, which happens to be The Twilight Zone. And if you're familiar with The Twilight Zone from the 1950s, they had some of the best short story writers of the day actually writing for them. And they were great with giving this kind of social commentary. And there was one episode in 1959 that was called Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder. And basically the plot, and we basically don't know the reveal until the very ending, which is very typical of the Twilight Zone with a twist ending. The plot is that there is this woman who's undergoing plastic surgery and we get some background. She's all wrapped up in bandages, so we can't see her face. And that the assumption is that she's undergone other surgeries and they've been unsuccessful. And then finally, the bandages are removed. This is right before commercial, of course. And what's revealed by, by any standard of, in our popular culture, in our society, is a very beautiful woman. But she streaks in horror. 
then of course we, we have the, the commercial. And then afterwards we get the pan out to the doctors. And I wanted to show you the image of that. Let's see if I can screen share. So this is a scene from that Twilight Zone episode that I was referencing. And the woman here in the middle is the woman who was undergoing plastic surgery. But you can see in comparison to the doctors who are these kind of pig face monstrosities, this is the standard of normality, what the doctors look like. And she is viewed as abnormal. It's an idea that was used also in the Munsters as well, if you're familiar with that television show. But I wanted to talk about the social commentary that either reinforces or challenges our social norms about normality, which means that we need to talk a little bit about horror if we're going to talk about horror film. And there's a disclaimer here that some of the material is going to be kind of graphic. So I wanted you all to be aware of that, specifically if they're younger members in the audience or there's some squeamish people in the audience or a little bit of both. And, and when we talk about horror film, we basically talk about genre, you know, which means a kind of category. So if you think about popular films, something like the romantic comedy or the rom-com is a kind of genre that has specific elements associated with it. And hopefully there is at least something that's unique or creative that'll keep our attention. But there's also something very comforting with knowing the formula ahead of time. It's almost like comfort food in many respects. So it's formulaic and familiar, but the good ones can also offer some creativity and something that's unique. And there are a group of people, much like myself, who actually enjoy the genre of horror. They actually like being scared. Um, and some of the elements of horror are related to the idea of monstrosity, which comes from the Latin monstraire, which means to show or reveal or demonstrate. And basically, that's how I'm going to be talking about horror film is what it shows or reveals or demonstrates. So some of the elements that you could expect to find in horror film, and, and none of this will seem terribly surprising, fear, anxiety, the threatening of normality, the examination of moral order, a figure under some kind of threat, more often than not female, possible supernatural elements, but there is an ambiguity that's involved in there as well, so that if a person doesn't necessarily want to embrace the supernatural, they can embrace a more natural explanation for the events that occur. An eerie atmosphere, which I think is what Halloween is all about. Again, it's about the atmosphere and creating the mood. A sense of doubling or twos or doppelganger that I'll talk about a little bit more. Specifically, the idea of horror film being a history of the anxieties of our cultures is what I wanted to talk about. And these anxieties are expressed in things like some of our cultural myths, our traditions, our legends, our fairy tales. And if you think about horror, there's a lot of genre blending that goes on. Oftentimes we think of horror in the context of something like science fiction, or oftentimes we think of horror or something like fantasy, um, and it can go both ways. In Dance Macabre, Stephen King talks about how horror examines the national phobic pressure points and the fears of the masses. And I, I think that's true, particularly in that particular time period. The political fears of the group, the economic fears of the group, the social fears of the group in allegorical or symbolic ways and, and representational ways. And as Stephen thinks, there are three levels, terror, that which requires imagination. So things are just suggested rather than shown to you. Horror, which is kind of mid-level and some things are shown to you, but it's not too graphic. You're still required to use some imagination. And then finally, the third level, the gross out, which is what many people think of when they think of horror. That's the lowest level. And according to King, he's not proud. He'll use all three if necessary in order to engage his audiences which might be why he's so popular. So why is it that people like myself enjoy something like horror? Um, there've been lots of um, scholarship about this, whether it's because of the release of endorphins that can occur when you're watching these images and stories and endorphins relieve stress and pain and, and oftentimes can bring a sense of pleasure, ironic, and or the adrenaline rush, which you've probably heard of in other contexts as well. Um, if you think about Greek tragedy, 
there is this idea of catharsis or purging of emotion that we engage in something like storytelling so that we can experience an emotion in a safe way. And that ultimately we know that at the ending, we can go back to our lives, but it allows us to have that emotion vicariously. Um, something like watching a sad movie, when you think about it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why, why would somebody pay money to be sad, to cry? But again, for individuals who like to watch sad movies, they talk about how that experience in some ways is very cathartic or it's very relieving, especially because they know that if a character dies on screen, that's not real. So this isn't real sadness at the level that one would have if a loved one died, let's say, for instance. Stephen King, going back to him, talks about individuals wanting to engage in deviance. And this is a safe way that we can all engage in the naughty and that which society says we shouldn't engage in. And then we can return to the status quo. In fact, he talks about how horror films are very conservative in many ways, because there's usually an, a reestablishment of the natural order by the ending. There is a scholar, actually, he was one of the first scholars to do work in horror film. His name is Robin Wood. And he wrote a very famous essay called An Introduction to Horror Film. And in his essay, he talks about how horror film lets us examine the psychologically repressed. And that horror film also allows us to examine otherness in a safe way. If you know anything at all about Sigmund Freud, he had an essay in 1919 called The Uncanny. And he talks about that what fear does is that it oftentimes brings back the repressed, that which is old and familiar. But the uncanny does that in unfamiliar and strange ways. And I think that's something that we'll see in many of the films that I'm going to be talking about. And as some of you are probably already aware of, there are a good number of critics of this particular genre. Individuals who say that the, the films are, are vulgar, immoral, crass, violent, and, and so are the audiences. I don't agree with that. I think horror film is oftentimes misunderstood and maligned. And yes, it does appeal oftentimes to adolescents because adolescents are at that point in life where they are trying to break taboos. But good horror, as I suggested earlier, also is a kind of social commentary on the cultural fears and anxieties of particular time periods, I think. And that's how I usually address it in my class. Now, the origins of horror film comes from the idea of Gothic. And I also teach a class in Gothic literature. Gothic is an architectural term. You might have heard of it when individuals are referencing things like cathedrals. You think about those long spires and so forth. And also it's a historical term in reference to the German conquerors. Um, and both of these were viewed as kind of grotesque and barbarian and excessive, which is where the term initially came from. The, the first Gothic novel has been identified as the Castle of Otranto. It was written in 1764 um, by British author Horace Walpole. I'll be the first to admit it's not a particularly well-written book. That said, it helped to establish a lot of the Gothic conventions that we think of today. And again, if you're going to a Halloween party this weekend, I suspect that you will be surrounded with settings that are very Gothic. So things like haunted castles and houses right behind me, um, a monster or a villain, as I was suggesting earlier, a damsel in distress, and a hero who is the savior. The dark and gloomy atmosphere and setting that, again, you're probably going to find in your typical Halloween party. Elements of decay and decadence. The idea of sanity and madness is something that you oftentimes find in horror film. I think particularly because in our own contemporary society and in society's past, there have been questions of what is sane and what is insane when you think about many of the elements of our society that just don't seem to make sense on the surface. So I had suggested earlier, possible supernatural, that which defies natural definition. The sense of doubling or doppelganger, this idea that we have a double in effect, a mirror image 
of ourselves and the sense of us and them, which gets us back to the idea of isms and difference. The height of the Gothic novel was probably in the 1800s in England, um, the Victorian period, which is known as a time of great repression. And things like Frankenstein, Dracula, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde probably have become so iconic in our culture. And they're all based on Gothic novels, but they've become iconic because of the film industry, which made changes to them, as oftentimes is the case. So some of the themes you're going to find in Gothic, good versus evil, health versus illness, truth versus deception, madness versus sanity, as I was suggesting earlier, reality versus fiction, and the normal versus the abnormal. And early cinema, basically, when we think about the early days of film, any image could inspire a certain level of fear because of the realism associated with that particular image. So even something like a train pulling into a station in the late 1800s or ocean waves could inspire fear. In fact, audiences, when they saw ocean waves, they would actually step back because they were afraid that they would get wet from the ocean waves. And if we think about the early Hollywood filmmakers, they were oftentimes immigrants who used myths and superstitions of their old world. Um, but eventually they gave us a restoration of order. In other words, this idea of the other being vanquished or Stephen King was talking about again, that restoration of order. So one tech that I use in my class is called Nightmares in Red, White and Blue. And it's an examination of horror film in the United States culture. And one scholar, Paul Wells, is quoted as saying that horror film is, quote, the history of horror film is essentially a history of anxiety. So what I wanted to do was to give you a kind of oversimplified view of anxiety. 1920s, when you think about the uh, recovery from World War I, um, disfigurement, death. 1930s, economic depression where audiences found escapism and solace in things like Gothic films or horror films that have become pop culture and mainstream. 1940s, World War II, where basically humanity itself is the monstrosity. And there's also a focus on abnormal psychology. 1950s, communism, alien invasion, and, and not just from different cultures, but also from space aliens as well. And the threat of nuclear war and annihilation. 1960s, the social rights movement. And what seemed to be, at least from some perspectives, the collapse of the American dream. The 1970s, the result of all of that, deviance and taboo. The 1980s, the pushback to the deviance and the taboo calls for this conservatism, if you are aware of the Reagan era, and returns to, quote, normalcy, unquote, whatever normalcy happens to be. 1990s, birth of technology, internet, and the fears associated with that. The 2000s and the new millennium and fears of Armageddon and, well, the ending of the world. And the 2010s, racial tensions particularly in light of the Obama election and the responses to that election afterwards. Here are some spoiler alerts here that I'm going to be talking about film. And I'm starting with the 1920s. What I ended up doing was selecting a film to represent each generation or each decade. And the 1920s probably is best known for the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, film critic Roger Ebert, calls it perhaps the first horror film, though there was a French three minute short in 1896 called The House of the Devil. And The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a German silent horror film, which meant that they would have live orchestras there basically playing for the soundtrack. And they were known for German expressionism. If you don't know German expressionism, you might be familiar with this image that you're looking at right now, Nosferatu. Um, and basically what German expressionism led to was a kind of cinema with disjointed and surreal and dreamlike images. Things were bizarre, things were shadowy. Look at all of the use of the shadows here. Oftentimes very symbolic. Themes of things like madness and insanity. 
and very artistically experimental. Again, these were the very early, early days. In terms of Dr. Caligari, this image shows us our two main characters in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, at least our two main villains. We have a, a film narrator by the name of Francis, who basically is telling us a story about these two villains. Um, that's the story frame. And then at the ending of the story, we go back to our narrator. The plot is that there's an evil Dr. Caligari right here in the top hat and that he hypnotizes his servant Cesar and is right here. And as some people have said that they, they think of um, some of the experimental films that they've seen um, with uh, Johnny Depp, for instance, with Edward Scissorhands and, and some of the similarities in appearance there. Um, and the idea is that Caligari is using Cesar to murder his enemies. And the way that the film is oftentimes read, again, it came out in the 1920s, and this is in Germany, we're still not in the United States, is that Dr. Caligari represents the German authoritarian government using basically hypnotizing, if you will, the German populace represented by Cesar, who happens to be asleep to the truth of what's occurring in order to murder Caligari's enemies. And that political commentary also is reinforced with some of the symbolism in the movie. For instance, the movie's name, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this idea of cabinets and what's inside the cabinet. Can the cabinet represent the subconscious? This idea also of Cesar, um, this sleepwalking Cesar reinforces that doppelganger idea that I was talking about earlier, the, the ghostly double that we have being awake and yet also being asleep at the same time. If you're familiar with Jordan Peele, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about him as the presentation continues, he came out with a film in 2019 called Us that also examines that idea of the double or the doppelganger. And Jordan Peele likes to play around with his titles. So Us doesn't just necessarily mean we, it also stands for United States. So, and that's all I'll say about that movie. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to see it because it's a great commentary actually on classism, talking about one of the isms. As I, I move forward and talk about post-World War anxieties, and this is another image from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, as you can see. Some of the fears of the time, things like madness, trauma, murder, disfigurement, again, this is right after World War, mutilation as soldiers were coming home being basically empty vessels of, once, of what they had once been, a kind of enforced conformity and economic depression, though of course we'll see more economic depression in, in, a, in a more clear way in the 1940s. The fears of mass industrialization and a terrifying reality of who exactly is the enemy. There, there are multiple twists in this film. The biggest twist is that we find out that our, our narrator, Francis, and again, spoiler alert, he's insane. And he's narrating all of this from a mental institution. So he's an unreliable narrator, leading to the question of who do we trust and what is real, which again is a central question in the 1920s. And I would suggest perhaps has been a, a central question since, if not even also before. And what is sanity and what is madness? Uh, a similar question that we'll also see in a film I'll be talking about soon, The Blair Witch Project. That this film is kind of this psychological mindscape, a, a dreamlike fantasy. And I think you can see that from this image, the cinematic techniques show the sense of distorted shapes, which you can see here, this kind of carnival and funhouse atmosphere. Um, there are things like unnaturally high stools and painted shadows on the walls and distorted angles and disjointed mix of art forms. If that film represents the 1920s, moving to the 1930s is when we get to America. And this is when we talk about the United States and how ultimately this is the golden age of horror film, the universal studio monster where you watched film for escapism, but I suggest also that a alert audience 
could also watch film for a kind of social commentary. And as I suggested earlier, they were loosely based on European 1800 Gothic texts, things like Fra Frankenstein, Dracula, so forth and so on. And some of the fears and anxieties of the time, um, things like the Great Depression, uh, European fascism, European communism, so a lot of uh, political fears, anti-Semitism, eugenics, the selective breeding by excluding those qualities that are thought to be inferior, and also the, the consequences of the 1920 women's right to vote. And can female now be seen as a powerful force, something to be feared? And Dracula is considered to be the first horror film in 1931, um, or at least the first American horror film. And the Library of Congress and the US National History listed it as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. But it was first adapted to screen in a bootleg version, the 1921 Nosferatu, which is what you are looking at now. And you can see again that, that sort of a German expressionism technique with the shadows. Uh, probably this is one of the more famous images from Nosferatu. And the director of the Dracula that we know um, from the 1930s has been called the father of American horror film. And he believed, this is a quote, that most people are morbid, unquote. You, you can decide whether you disagree or agree with that. Todd Browning is probably best known for a movie he made called Freaks in 1932. This was a pre-code movie that ended up being banned because it was considered to be so horrific because real freaks, quote unquote, were, were used in this film, a film that's about exterior and interior deformity. And you can see that. It's very much a film about ableism. So when we're talking about the isms again, um, since of course the birth of the internet, you can get access to just about anything. So you don't necessarily have to um, look for a, a, a version that's, that's underground in the way that you would have to do in the 1990s because it was banned at, at one point. You can find it fairly easily on the internet if you wanted to watch this particular film. So Dracula, as I had indicated, was based on the 1897 novel by Bram Stoker. Um, and it's interesting how that novel came about. Um, it was partially inspired by a short story called The Vampire. Um, and this short story was written during a ghost story competition with um, a Dr. Polidari who wrote The Vampire and also a name that you might be familiar with, a Mary Shelley. And basically Mary Shelley is known for writing Frankenstein, which is what came out of that ghost story competition for Mary Shelley. She ended up creating Frankenstein and Dr. Polidori ended up creating the vampire, which we think helped to inspire Bram Stoker. So that was a very important night in the Gothic tradition. And basically Stoker brilliance, he, he used the name Vlad the Impaler or Vlad Dracula associating Dracula with the cruel 1400s Romanian conqueror. And at initially Dracula was first adapted as a Broadway play. And, and during that play, a lot of the stage conventions that we've become accustomed to with Dracula were established. Like the Cape Collar, for instance, was used as a, um, a special effect prop where they would have a trap door where Dracula could disappear a trap door on stage, this is how Dracula would vanish. And they would set up the costume and the collar in such a way that that would remain standing so that it would seem like he was still there. The film, as films oftentimes do, it collapses the text, simplifies the plot and it simplifies the characters. Um, and the story that most people know of Dracula is based on the film, not necessarily on the text. And the story is so iconic, you know, I probably don't even need to detail much in the way of, of the plot. You've got a, a Transylvanian vampire who attacks um, the British, mostly female, and the Gothic elements in the text, much like what you're looking at now, you can see these great grandiose sets with many of the architectural elements that I was talking about earlier in terms of Gothic. Originally, the film had no soundtrack. 
uh, no film soundtrack. It, it, it did have audio. So it's eerily silent when you're watching the way that it was originally presented. And Hungarian Bela Lugosi, who's also become iconic, got the lead role and that basically established his career for better or worse. Uh, interesting piece of trivia, he learned the role phonetically. It's one of the reasons why he has this odd pronunciation and inflection that we think of when we think of vampire, that I want to suck your blood, which by the way, he never says in the film. Now, I wanted you to pay particular attention to this pendant here that he's wearing, um, because oftentimes this pendant is read as a commentary on possible anti-Semitism because of its parallels with the Star of David. And there's a, a lot of different ways that you can read this film, but definitely Christianity is presented as savior and anything outside of Christianity is wrong and, and unable to save individuals from evil. You're gonna get a lot of Christian imagery in this film. And that also science has to embrace religion which is also something that we see in The Exorcist that I, I'm going to be talking about um, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, but the Van Helsing science character in Dracula is one who is able to embrace both science, but also religion at the same time. And some of the symbolism or the way that this film has been read is that Dracula is kind of this blood sucking capitalist who's taking advantage of the weaker masses, or Dracula is also this evil animalistic foreigner and other, a kind of reverse imperialism. Um, and basically he's invading the British. Also Dracula is seen as a kind of sexual predator um, and the bite that is uh, through its penetration, it's, it's very symbolic from a sexual perspective. And what that results in is the corruption of the British, particularly the corruption of female and the tainting of societal bloodlines. So if we think about the idea of the film code during this time, which said that the other, that which was considered to be the monstrosity had to be destroyed so that we've got an establishment of normalcy. That's exactly what we get with Dracula at the ending of the film is that he's destroyed. If we go to the 1940s, the film I selected, which might be a little bit less iconic, is Cat People. And there was a, um, there was a, a version that was done, I believe in the 1980s that really played on the idea of the sexuality in Cat People. But even for the 1940s, Cat People is a very sexual film. Little piece of trivia, this is the first horror film that's offered a jump scare. Um, it's a bus scene where, and actually it's through audio, where the bus stops and it screeches in a way that sounds like the, the cry of a cat. And you can tell from this movie poster here that obviously cats aren't going to be important in terms of this film. It's, it's very moody, it's very atmospheric, it's very uh, film noir-like. It's, it's shot beautifully with its use of fog and shadows. It's very subtle, ambiguous, and suggestive. I've, I've often wondered why it isn't better known because it, it really is a very interesting film. And it's also very psychological and very Freudian, particularly in reference to sexuality. Now, if we think about the time in the 1940s, uh, World War II, and women joining the workforce, as I had suggested earlier, and the threat of female I think that's very evident in this particular film, especially the fear of female power and female sexuality, where our lead character, who happens to be appropriately dressed in red here, you can see, obviously she's the villain. Um, our lead character is not only female, her name is Arena, but she's also a foreigner. She's Serbian, which I think is also commentary on the uh, threat of what happens when foreigner invades um, America. So the film is based on the premise of a Serbian folk tale that if a, a female, and this is some blend, some genre blending here of fantasy, that female passion leads to something that is uncontrollable, a transformation that leads to the bestial. In this specific instance, a cat. 
And if you think about the cat, there's lots of symbolism and imagery associated with the cat. The cat's very animalistic and predatory. There's also associations with the cat and superstitious evil. And also the cat was worshipped um, in Egyptian times. In other words, a kind of non-Christian um, worship, which I think is definitely referenced in this text that this old world Serbian arena needs to be defeated by the new world American and Christian Oliver. In fact, he's even referenced, and this is a quote, as a good old Americano. So here is his picture. I don't think you can get any more good old Americano than this. Oh, we see his particular picture. And the sense of reverse Darwinism, that there is a reversal to ancient traits and sin, particularly if we don't embrace the Christian, is embedded within the text. And one of the things that I had suggested earlier is that it's filmed beautifully, that the shadows are just lovely. And there's one image in particular where Oliver and another character are fighting off the evil um, cat person. And you can see in this image, he happens to be holding a T-square because he's an architect and this is happening in his office. This is the image we're given, which very much looks like a cross as he's fighting off this sense of evil. And that's very deliberate. Um, there, there are also very similar kinds of, of Christian images and things like Dracula. For instance, there's a table setting at one point that looks like a Christian altar. And in fact, that there's something similar in cat people as well. There's also a good amount of Eurocentrism in, in this particular film represented through a black waitress who is lamenting the idea that nobody wants to eat the restaurant's gumbo. Instead, what they want is apple pie and coffee. So when I move to the 1950s, we've got Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1956, which is based on a Jack Finney, actually, 1956 science fiction novel of the same name. Again, some genre blending here where it's viewed as horror, but can also be viewed as science fiction. And now we're at the point where we are fearing the uncertainties of the future rather than some of the legacies of the past that we saw with things like Dracula, or we also saw with things like cat people. Some of the 1950s fears and anxieties, again, in a very oversimplified way, the atom bomb, the early Cold War and the possibility of World War III, the fear of invasion and immigration, as I suggested earlier, not just from other cultures, but also space aliens. Because keep in mind in 1948, there was the flying saucer crash in Roswell, New Mexico. This was also the time of suburban white flight where basically Caucasian families left the city because it was deemed too dangerous because there were too many others that were moving in, people who were different than themselves and took refuge in the suburbs which were supposed to be a, a kind of refuge. Though this film shows that that refuge can be easily invaded and I, I took this shot from Invasion of the Body Snatchers to show the idealistic version of the suburbs that we are initially presented with, right down to mowing the lawn, the lawn being so important in American culture. But the film usually is read as some sort of a commentary on communism, that the other, um, which is represented by things like political difference, is invading that communism is basically planting seeds against personal liberty, a dehumanization that goes on. The plot is that there are these emotionless space alien seed pods taking over human bodies. Again, so that's how you see the idea of these emotionless space aliens representing communism, for instance, taking over human bodies, in other words, taking over Americans. And the setting is very telling because it takes place in a small town in California called Santa Mira, which means to, Mira means to look in Spanish. And that's what this film wants us to do is to look and see the dangers that are around us if we don't pay attention and we have to stop them. In fact, there's one image of the town common when all of the aliens are gathering together and you can see the stop written in large letters on the um, asphalt. Again, very deliberate, you know, that we need to stop this from happening. 
The transformation occurs when individuals fall asleep. So the dangers of being asleep, not being awake, not paying attention. We saw that with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Cesar. If you're familiar with the Nightmare on Elm Street series, you also know that that occurs when you fall asleep. The original ending for this particular film was pretty pessimistic, uh, much like the original ending for Get Out, which is another film that I'm going to be talking about. But it was changed based on test audiences that they wanted something a little bit more optimistic. And the film is usually read through the, the theme of the doppelganger or the double, that the monster is our family, the monster is our friend, the monster is ourselves. And I've always thought that the gender commentary in this particular film is quite interesting. You can see this image that I have here of the two central characters. The female um, characters, their concerns are dismissed until they're verified by the male lead who we see here with Dr. Miles Bennell. The character we see here, Becky, this is his former girlfriend, but I think she very much illustrates the changing gender roles of the time. For the time, maybe even for today, I'm not sure. That dress is pretty darn revealing, that strapless tight dress. Um, she is newly divorced and there's a good amount of sexual innuendo that goes on between her and Miles. She is ultimately transformed into one of the aliens at the end. In other words, she is turned into a monstrosity. She's punished, if you will, by, by being turned into a monstrosity. Miles is not, even though he also is divorced, and even though he also is rather flirty with her, though he's certainly not wearing clothing like this. You can see that he's very much in the attire one would consider to be respectability during the time period. There's an important quote in the film that I think kind of summarizes this entire presentation, and it's the concerns of what they're viewing, this transformation of these emotionless individuals. And the first response as they're trying to figure out what's going on in this is that it's some sort of mass hysteria that's being caused by worry of what's going on in the world. If you remember, I was talking about horror films examining, well, worry of what's going on in the world the fears and anxieties of the society during the time. So as I was suggesting, the film is usually read as an allegory of communism, that these space aliens are invading and McCarthyism. And what is the result? Is that these pod people are going to be taking over our American way of life. There's this sense of post-war paranoia and this loss of humanity and individuality. So that moves us to the 1960s. And if we think about the 1960s, the film that I wanted to talk about is The Psycho, which has probably become iconic in part because of its director. You know, this is really the early deification of directors that we see now. And Alfred Hitchcock. Psycho is based on a 1959 Robert Bloch novel um, of the same name that was loosely based on the Ed Ginn murders um, that involved cannibalizing women. There definitely is a sense in Psycho about violence against female, um, just like we see in the, in the text as well. More maybe genre blending in that Psycho in some ways is a detective story. It's a whodunit. Um, and a little piece of trivia here, Edgar Allan Poe, um, short story writer that you're probably familiar with, quite important in the Gothic tradition, has been credited with writing the modern detective story. So it seems appropriate that Psycho would be using, and other Gothic texts and films use elements of detective stories within them. Hitchcock has actually been called the father of the modern horror film. And it was made with a small budget, but it was a commercial success, very much with a Gothic setting. And the, the Bates Hotel, I would suggest is, or the Bates Motel is probably the American modernized version of the Gothic castle. And you can see the more modern area here and then the more Gothic area here in the back. And the film is basically this psychological horror of what happens with an isolated family unit, the domestic seclusion that might be occurring, particularly in the 1950s with some of that white flight that I was suggesting earlier, that the home isn't a refuge, it's become a prison 
And in fact, some people have argued that the television, which became the central element in the home, was the replacement for the fireplace. It was the electronic hearth. You could even see the flickering images on the TV the way you would see the flickering flames, let's say, in a fire. And we see the negative consequences of isolation. People become socially and mentally unstable. And I, I've always liked to think about this as perhaps also a commentary geopolitically and isolationist po policies and the negative consequences of that. We definitely see the secrets behind closed doors and that no place is safe even the suburbs, oh, even the shower. And that's probably how this film is best known for, that shower scene. Um, the horror isn't from outer space anymore. It, it, it's within us, it's right next door. Censors and, and were all over this scene to try to boycott it. it it's a, a, a mastery of editing because audiences will swear that they see that knife penetrate this character as she's taking a shower and that never happens. We see knife and then we see shower, we see blood, but they never make connection. But this is a wonderful example of Stephen King's talking about how we use imagination um, and that that is the most horrific thing. And if you've ever been alone in a house and you've heard a strange noise, then you know exactly how the power of imagination has so much strength over an individual as opposed to let's seeing some monstrosity with all kinds of special effects that we would see on film as we've become so jaded and say, well, I'm not that scared by that, bring it on. So at any rate, this shower scene, as we see here, has probably immortalized this particular film, which upset so many expectations of the audience. At the time, Alfred Hitchcock was known for his television show. He wasn't known for necessarily something that would be this graphic. And the film, the plot is that we've got a, a motel manager, Norman Bates, who in the guise of his mother ends up committing murders. Um, we first end up empathizing with this central character who is a thief, it turns out that we learn. And then of course the central character is killed, which upsets our expectations. And then we've got the twist ending that not only is Norman Bates committing the murders, but he's committing the murders in the guise of his mother. And definitely we can see through this image how female is victimized and brutalized, the anger and hostility against female. Little bit of trivia for this film, there's a lot of bird imagery. Bird was used as a slang term for female and the central character's name, this one that we're looking at, her name is Marion Crane. The crane is a bird. She's told at one point by Norman that she eats like a bird. Norman taxidermies birds, oh, and his mother as well. So again, lots of spoilers here. Another theme in this particular film is this idea of voyeurism, not just that Norman is spying in on individuals during private moments, such as showering, but we are spying in by watching the film. And I think this is a great commentary on television and media in general, that we've become voyeurs in effect, a nation of voyeurs. The film helped to inspire other, well, the film inspired many directors, but one director in particular who's known for his own horror film is John Carpenter of Halloween, which I'll be talking about soon. But I said I was selecting films from each decade and this is where I cheated. Um, I guess this is professorial privilege because I have two films from the 1960s. But keep in mind that the 1960s were a particularly tumultuous decade of conflict and fear and uprising. So that's my rationale for giving two films for the 1960s. And the second film is Night of the Living Dead. Now, George Romero, basically the director of Night of the Living Dead, reinforced the idea of, or reinvented the idea of the zombie, which was introduced in pop culture in the 1932 film starring Bela Lugosi, a name we know of from Dracula, called White Zombie. And this film, you can see from this image here, an American film is about how Haitian zombies are created through voodoo, hypnotism, and drugs. So there's a combination of all three here. And the film is usually read as a metaphor for slavery. And of course, the real threat is not slavery or zombie hood, 
the thread is when a white person becomes enslaved or turned into zombiehood. So, but George Romero basically reinvented that tale. He never even came up with the word zombie. Um, this was something that one of the critics in viewing his film called these monstrosities and he ended up embracing it because he thought it was good public relations. He is known for Night of the Living Dead. And you can see here that this film, black and white, and, and that was a, a choice made because of uh, some of the budget constraints, but I think that it's also beautifully shot in black and white. I think it would have lost a lot if it was shot in color because we get this great sense of shadow here. So, you know, this, this idea that something that was negative ended up turning out to be a positive when Romero finally got enough money so that he could refilm in color, he decided not to, which I think was a really great choice because he saw some of the images and was impressed by his own work. I, I don't know what that says about Romero, but at any rate, he oftentimes talks about how this film for him was a commentary on the 1960s, that the film is a film of ultimately revolution. Now, another film from the 1960s that you might be familiar with, Rosemary's Baby. It's about a woman who ends up giving birth to the Antichrist. Um, the 1960s had this apocalyptic sense to it. Um, that I think you can see in many of the films like Rosemary's Baby. In fact, there was a, a headline in Rosemary's Baby that was taken from an actual publication of the time period stating God is dead to give you an idea of sort of the mindset of the 1960s. And the film opens actually with an image of an American flag. So this gives us the sense through the opening credits that this is going to be a commentary on the United States. And we're told very early on that there's a time change that has happened. And this is definitely a not so veiled reference that the times are changing here. And of course, being said in nighttime that this is the descent or the downfall of a world that has basically gone mad, illustrated through these zombies. But the reality is, is that first we're the monsters because we end up being zombies. Um, they are masses that, that uprise, these, these living dead hordes, as we see here, but they aren't the real monsters at all. And this is an uh, idea that usually is taken up in zombie films. The, the real monsters are the survivors, and, and these are the farmhouse survivors. This is where most of the movie takes place, a group of individuals who are trying to survive from these horde attacks and they're unable to work together or form a sense of community. This idea of the importance, we need to not pay attention to our difference, but we need to pay attention to the fact that we need to embrace difference, not think of it as a negative, and also work together as community. This is particularly important in light of the lead of this particular film. His name is Ben, and he's African-American. And at the time, this was huge to have a black actor cast as the lead role. And according to George Romero, he didn't have any kind of political or social commentary when he cast this actor, that this was simply the best actor for the job. But he acknowledged and the actor himself said that once you cast a black actor in this role, it completely changes the story and the dynamic. You can see here, he's holding a gun. So he's seen as a threat. He basically needs to defend himself, and that means attacking others who are oftentimes, who are always actually Caucasian in this particular film. Now, Ben survives, and he's supposed to be the hero in this film, but at the ending, he's killed mistakenly through police officers who think that he has been zombified. And the image at the ending of the film, which is deliberately shot as grainy stills, it eerily resembles um, racist police shootings that we could even parallel with today. You can see he's carried away here after he's shot like a piece of meat thrown in the bonfire with the other zombies. The ending horrified people that the hero would be killed in that way. And it was viewed definitely as a commentary of the way that blacks were viewed and perhaps are still viewed in our society. The film also shows the, the collapse of the nuclear family. You've got a set of parents that are killed by their young daughter. 
which was considered horrifying. And some say this is the beginning of seeing children as basically the enemy or the threat, which we'll see in The Exorcist. And that scene is very reminiscent of Psycho in some ways. Um, a brother kills his own sister. Of course, he's been zombified at that point. Even the young lovers, you know, the idea that young love saves the day, that doesn't work in this particular film because this dating couple is killed as well. And it also examines all of these ineffective institutions of authority, government, law enforcement, media. Um, basically, government authorities don't know what's going on, and they're giving the survivors incorrect advice. The same is happening with law enforcement. The same is happening with the media broadcast. There's also, I think, interesting gender commentary on the female. The, the female lead quickly descends into weakness and she falls into this kind of stereotypical role. She falls when she's running away from the zombies and then she ends up in a kind of catatonic state. There we see her in her catatonic state. Her name is Barbara. This was also a very meta film because um, at one point she's told by her brother you know, they're coming to get you, Barbara. So now we're at the point where horror films could basically reference themselves. That means horror film has probably entered into popular culture land. So 1970s, and what I've selected for the 1970s is The Exorcist. I, I cannot tell you what kind of a cultural phenomenon this film was. It came out in 1973. It was based on the New York Times bestselling novel by William Peter Blatty. And he worked very closely on the film. So the film is actually quite similar to the text. Um, the difference is that they omitted some of the text because of length. And it was a blockbuster film. And it's where we think of that term blockbuster and that individuals are standing around the block trying to get tickets for entrance into the film. Um, so that was the term of blockbuster before it was a video store. And both references date me, I suppose. But you can see all of these individuals here standing, trying to get into The Exorcist. It was a media event, you know, where individuals would see this film and would come out in hysterics. Um, individuals would faint. Individuals would need to be hospitalized. Um, one man literally attacked the screen because he wanted to kill the demon. Um, there are lots of reasons why this film had that kind of cultural impact. Um, they used lots of subliminal techniques, both with audio and visual, in order to get that kind of reaction. It was based on Christianity, and supposedly it was based on a live exorcism, or real exorcism, I should say, so that ultimately that was there, there was a religious fear embedded in watching this particular film. And also, it was a, a time period, 1970s, that was known for its drug culture. So if someone showed up under the influence to see this film, and I suggest quite a few people showed up under the influence to see this film, all of those elements together worked for some of the very extreme reactions. It also has a very iconic musical score, Tubular Bells, which, another piece of trivia about me, that happens to be the ringtone of my cell phone, of course. I'd have the exorcist theme. And it, it talks about lots of cultural taboos. That's probably another reason why um, this film had such strong reactions against it. And it violated those cultural taboos and showed it in great detail. And this film very much focused on what Stephen King talked about, the gross out, you know, the idea of showing an image so horrific that it's going to literally gross you out. The plot is that a young girl becomes a kind of possessed monstrosity. That's probably what most people think of when they think of something like The Exorcist. It actually earned an X rating in Boston. Another piece of trivia there. I've always said this film and the text itself has been misread and misviewed. That if you look at the title, it's about The Exorcist. It's not about the possessed girl. And when you see the film from that perspective and you focus on The Exorcist, and actually there are two exorcists in the film, a father Karis and a father Marin, and how they are tormented both by their inner demons and also tormented by this girl demon. I think the film and the text becomes much more interesting. There's a, a deleted scene in the film that is included in 
or that is included in the extended version that's called the version you've never seen before, which I think is a sad title because once you've seen it, then it's no longer the version you've never seen before. That the purpose, the real purpose of possession is to torment others. It's not necessarily to torment the person who is possessed. And you can see here some of those tormented others with our two exorcists here, where Marin, and they don't get into this very much in the film, is very arrogant and proud. There's this old literary tradition of punishing arrogance and pride. And we've got Karis, who basically is tormented by guilt because he's left his impoverished mother to go into the priesthood. He's living a uh, at least from um, the perspective of his uh, mother's lifestyle, uh, a rather, a rather, shall I say, um, privileged life. And then we see how the hero, much like in the other film, is Christianity. Christianity is the savior, as we've seen oh, in so many other films, as we see our two priests here. Um, and both of them end up sacrificing themselves. Both priests die basically to defeat evil. The film begins in Iraq and the text does as well. And many audiences were kind of um, confused by the fact that, that it started in Iraq, but Iraq has some folklore associated with it. It's supposed to be the reputed place of the Garden of Eden, Eden which is where the fall of humanity occurred. So this establishes the importance of religion right from the very beginning of the film. And one of the major themes of the film, as I had suggested with uh, Father Karras, is the evil of wealth and privilege in the face of poverty. And we definitely see that in the mother of the possessed girl who has also been haunted by her own inner demons of guilt and privilege. She happens to be a very wealthy actress. She's living in Washington, DC. Might I suggest that that's now the new American seat of evil. If it started in Iraq, it's now in Washington, DC. She's an atheist, so there's religious commentary there. She's divorced, so there's social commentary there. Remember, we're in the 1970s. Oh, and there's a Ouija board in the house, just to sort of fill out everything. And the film very much examines a lot of the turmoil of the 1970s, where actress, the, the actress character, film, uh, Chris, is even filming a scene of campus protests. Um, definitely, there was this sense that individual children were acting like they were possessed when they were on drugs. And I think you see that embedded within this text. Um, it was the time of Vietnam in the sense that the world was going to hell. So why not have the devil come? Lots of symbolism in this film. One of the more particularly interesting pieces I think has to do with entryways. Lots of doors are filmed. That this is an entrance into the psyche or an entrance into social commentary. Then when we get to the 1980s, I took some liberties. I went to a film that came out in 1978, so I cheated. It's Halloween, but I think that film from 1978 was so important for the slasher film movement of the 1980s. It really anticipates that, where the director, John Carpenter, as I had indicated, he was very much influenced by Psycho. Um, in fact, this idea of looking and gazing is something that we see with Michael Myers, um, the, um, the antagonist in the film, the, the evil villain. And also Halloween has an iconic soundtrack, which, which helps it become memorable. Um, the name of the doctor is Dr. Sam Lewis, Loomis, which happens to be the name in Psycho. And also another piece of trivia, Janet Leigh, who starred in Psycho, that great shower scene, her daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis here, is the lead in Halloween. Um, the film was released independently and regionally, first in Kansas City for a budget of only $320,000, made over $55 million in sales. It is, believe it or not, Halloween is one of the highest grossing films of all times with lots of innovative cinematography. Um, what we call now the steady cam was known as Panaglide so that we could see the murderer's view. And the 1980s also coincides with Reaganism, an era of political conservatism. And slasher films are oftentimes read, whether they were deliberately created this way or not, as examining the consequences of the collapse of the family. Um, what happens when they're absent parents? Um, you have teens 
who basically engage in sexual promiscuity and kids even become murderers. When you think about the child, Michael Myers, when he commits his first murder, some have even said he's one of the first serial killers that you can see evidenced in film. The plot is a child murderer kills his sister and boyfriend after they have sex on Halloween night. And he's put in a mental institution. He escapes that mental institution as an adult and goes on a Halloween killing spree of teenagers. This is another film where we get this seeming critique of the idealistic suburbia, um, because this is the area in which Michael Myers is targeting his victims. Um, and what is under the mask of this seemingly safe suburbia? Um, some pretty horrific realities since Michael Myers was brought up in that area as well. Little piece of trivia, the Michael Myers mask that everybody thinks of as you know being iconic to Michael Myers was actually a mask of the actor William Shatner of Star Trek fame that was basically redone to be Michael Myers. It also established this idea of the final girl that we've got a female who lives, so she isn't killed, but she also is tormented, which leads, the, leads to the idea of the female being kind of complicated here. In some ways we see strength, but in other ways we see that violence and brutality against female that we've seen in other films. The 1990s gets me to the Blair Witch Project, which started the found footage movement of the 1990s that still occurs today. Very meta because it's a movie about a movie. And the 1990s was really the birth of the internet. So I always see this film as a commentary on some of the fears of technology. The marketing was genius for the time period in that ultimately there was an internet website, um, blairwitch.com, where they supposedly had real newsreel footage and interviews of the three student filmmakers who are highlighted in the film. They're shooting a documentary about some sort of urban le legend of the evil Blair Witch. On TV, there was also what was supposed to be a documentary about the curse of the Blair Witch on the sci-fi channel. In fact, again, some people thought it was real. And on the internet movie database, the actors were listed as deceased, which, they, which is what occurs in the film. So again, there was this sense of audiences watching something that was real. The camera was very shaky, which helps to create realism, but also creates a lot of physical discomfort in an audience to kind of mimic the physical discomfort of the characters. And there was a lot of method acting that was going on in this film, which also gives it a sense of realism. It's an independent movie on a shoestring budget, $60,000, nothing. It earned over $250 million. It could give you an idea of the kind of profitability that can be associated with horror film. And in many ways, it's similar to the slasher films where you isolate your characters and you eliminate them by dehumanizing them. But I, I always see it as uh, anticipating many of the concerns and anxieties of not only that time, but our contemporary period. What is reality, for instance? The characters are unsure of what is real and what is not real. They're using film cameras to record, but as is stated in the movie, um, Technology records, but it also distorts. So there's this idea of the technological uncanny where one of the characters even tells the lead filmmaker, I see why you like this video camera so much. It's not quite reality. It's like a filtered reality. It's like you can pretend everything's not quite the way it is. And think about some of our own concerns with things like social media. And I think that's a very applicable statement. That main filmmaker who we see here, she's choosing to live in that filtered reality as she's filming, rather than working together with her peers to save herself and to save them. Um, I, I think it also is a commentary of what happens when you don't, as a community, join together. And also, I think it's a, a commentary with female leading because she's leading and, and things go very badly in this particular film. So again, a lot of times we see these films have very negative images embedded and messages about female. The plot is that there's these three filmmakers that are lost in the woods, they're student filmmakers, they experience eerie events, and then the group quickly falls apart because the monster is within, the monster is within them. 
And that film shows the misunderstandings and the divisions and the conflicts and the isolation brought about by technology that we see in our contemporary times. The technology, yes, it can unite, but it can also divide. And it exacerbates difference and conflict between us. As I was suggesting earlier, that that's what the isms do. Another thing that I always thought was interesting that also is contemporary, that humans seem unable to survive in nature because of our over-reliance on technology. And definitely we see that in something like the, the Blair Witch. So for the 2000s, I am going to Britain. There she is, Heather, the filmmaker of the Blair Witch Project, constantly with that camera. 28 Days Later, this is a British film that came out by Danny Boyle in 2002. That's usually seen as a kind of updated zombie tale. Though if you're a zombie purist, then you would say that this doesn't necessarily follow the rules of what a zombie is. But of course, since zombies are fictional, I don't know if they're necessarily rules um, because these are fast zombies as opposed to slow zombies. Um, the time period, the 2000s, the new millennium, where the concern I think is global about apocalypse and the possible end of the world, which is what we see with something like 28 days later with a plot that a virus quickly spreads and destroys society. And the virus's name is the rage virus. So that's a thinly veil veiled metaphor for how hatred and violence and rage are universal and contagious. And it's created through scientific experimentation, the kind of mad scientist playing God, and also excessive media exposure, because we have an opening scene there of a lab chimp that's strapped down to watch violent news images. Um, and that helps to bring forth the rage virus. Um, the contemporary parallels to COVID don't escape me here. But I, I see the film as a kind of critique of, again, the media, the government, and the scientific community that we saw in Night of the Living Dead, um, all of those abuses of authoritarian institutions. Also a, a really interesting critique on consumerism. There are lots of images of billboards in this deserted city um, as individuals have been killed or have been zombified. There's discarded money and plastic and, and souvenirs on the ground. Again, the fear and anxiety of the ending of the world. And the film shows the importance of community and others and unity. Um, it begins and ends with the word hello. In other words, trying to reach out for connection. Though note that the word root for hello is hell, which is something that they play with towards the ending of the film as well. And our group of survivors, as you can see here, basically form this kind of new blended family that doesn't have class or race distinctions. And our two main characters over here form a couple. Jim is a Caucasian courier and Selena is a black chemist um, and Hannah who ends up being with them after this character is killed, basically becomes their kind of adopted daughter from another family. Another film message that I, I think is very important is that human destruction does not mean the ending of the world, um, that we shouldn't be so human centric. The world in this film continues on quite beautifully, even though humanity is destroyed. Um, we see these wonderful images of nature um, these horses running in a field. This is one of the images of the nature that we see. And the horses quite tellingly are both black and white. Again, I think a commentary or could be read as a commentary about racial unity. And the current message for us that's embedded in this film is that quarantine works. So I'll just leave it at that and go to 2010s. Um, and 2010s, uh, a film that has become also quite iconic, even though it hasn't been out very much. Get Out, uh, 2017 by Jordan Peele, known for his comedy, but he's merged into horror. The film won an Academy Award uh, for original screenplay. Um, he was the first black winner for an Academy Award. And certainly there is a lack of representation of African-Americans in horror film. Um, the film commentary, I think is very applicable to the 2010s about racism being the true American monster and that Obama's election did not mean a post-racial America. 
And what we see are all kinds of microaggressions going on by ignorant, awkward, elite, mostly Caucasian, and that that's masking huge macroaggressions. The plot is that we've got this wealthy, mostly Caucasian um, group of individuals buying and literally inhabiting the bodies of Blacks. And the film is very much about class and wealth, but it's also about the literal history of American slavery and contemporary US economic slavery. When we think about the elite benefiting from the poorly compensated and the disenfranchised. Um, and also just the general commentary on our current state of racism. Lots of punning going on with the title of Get Out. Obviously the main character should get out or leave, but also there's this sense of, get out, like when people don't believe you, you're kidding me, this can't really still be happening anymore, the sense of denial, as well as getting out the message or the truth that one, racism is alive and well in the United States and probably on the planet, and also that the disenfranchised see the truth and state it, but they're told that they're wrong in their perceptions. And what we see is Chris, our main character here, who is black with his white girlfriend. And the plot is that they are visiting for the first time her wealthy white family. The girlfriend's father introduces himself as saying he's a collector. And we find out that he literally is collecting black bodies. This film has an incredible amount of foreshadowing in it. It's a very deliberate kind of film. Um, at the beginning, we see Chris shaving. He cuts himself with white shaving cream. Um, the girlfriend towards the ending of the film is eating colored Fruit Loops with the white milk separated off in a glass. The father says that he has concerns about black mold in the basement and it just goes on and on. Um, so I, it, I encourage you not just to watch this film but rewatch this film because it's so symbolic and so ironic. Uh, Chris at one point saves himself by putting cotton in his ears and this subverts the use of cotton when we think about the history of slavery, um, the cotton blocks the hypnotic version of Chris being put into the sunken place. Then the sunken place represents the place of marginalization and oppression of all of the marginal, marginalized. Here's an image of him putting cotton in his ears. Of course, slaves picked cotton. And you could say that the girlfriend and family are trying to create the perfect human. That gets us back to eugenics about blending black physicality um, along with Caucasian intellect. And the film shows black Americans, the marginalized, trapped and controlled in a white person's mind. Or you could say that's a metaphor for white society. In the plot, there's a blind man who buys Chris's body because he wants to inhabit it. And he says he's colorblind which illustrates even individuals who say they're colorblind, they commit pain and hurt in a racist society. Um, now, the alternate ending to this was rather dark where Chris was in prison, um, but it was changed to a quote, happy ending, in part because basically Chris deserves to be saved, um, but he's not saved from a society that will continue to objectify him. So this is not a completely happy ending. And the film basically shows what it means to be black in the United States, which is being subject to constant covert and overt racism, which we can say is true of disenfranchised groups in general. I really encourage you to see this movie. If you're gonna see any of the movies I talked about, this is the one. And the documentary that I really encourage you to watch is Horror Noir, which talks about a history of black horror you can get it on YouTube. You can stream it for free. It came out in 2019, which talks about Get Out and Night of the Living Dead and, and many of the other films. So that, that gets us to now, the 2020s. And what will the film be for our decade? We're still early in our decade. Uh, I'm eagerly awaiting Jordan Peele's new film that's called Nope. It's going to be released on July 22nd of 2022. The only information we have about it is this movie poster. He refuses to talk about it and he has enough cachet in the industry to be able to get away with something like that. Knowing Jordan Peele, I'm assuming two, 20 or 22 are significant. And if you 
don't necessarily want to wait that long. What I do recommend that you could see, it's not a film, so I'm cheating a little bit here. It happens to be a series through HBO. It's called Lovecraft Country. And Jordan Peele also was involved with it. He was a producer for it. It's from the 19, or it shows us the 1950s United States and segregation. And that the real monsters are things like racism, sexism, and, and also homophobia as well. It was nominated for 18 Emmys. It won two for sound editing and guest actor. That was for the uh, uncle character. And well, I stop screen sharing here. Oh, here we go. Hi. So hopefully you can see me again. Um, thanks for listening. And if you wanted to learn more about the genre, I'm teaching a class in horror film in popular culture and media, CMN 201. Um, that's at GCC spring semester on Wednesday evening. I wanted to thank the Lava Center for hosting me and give one last screen share and wish you all from Count Pugula a happy Halloween. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.